We finally made it. The end of the Owl House's first season with the conclusion, Young Blood, Old Souls, which continued to flesh out Bellos in subtle ways, set up characters to come in season two, and give us a resolution to Ida and Lilith's fractured sibling dynamic, and so much more that I don't want to give away in this intro. So as always, we're going to break it all down. Of course, spoiler warning, if you are not caught up with the Owl House, please go catch up and then come back. With all that said, let's dive in. We open with King narrating a new piece of Emperor Bellus's origin, found within a book that, unlike King's own catalog of the Isles, I don't believe was created by him due to its higher quality, despite the wear and tear, and its handwriting. The Unauthorized Boiling Isles History, written by an author whose name is conveniently erased. If I had to take a stab in the dark and assume this is a character we'd be familiar with in some capacity, my money is either on, again, a potential IRL Azura or a Noceda. So the elaboration of Bellus' origin is as follows. The Boiling Isles, named after the raging hot water of the Boiling Sea, are composed of the bones of a fallen titan. Already I'm wondering, how did this titan fall? Throughout the ages, other monumental bones have been sighted in the boiling seas, raising the possibility that many such creatures stalked the demon realm in eons past. As yet, the titan of the boiling isles remains the only complete skeleton known. Where did the titans come from? How did they perish? I hope one day, we can uncover these mysteries. Hey, yeah, me too, near fourth wall breaking book. Now, there are three illustrations on these two pages. One of the Titan's hand, assumably after it was slain, at sunset. Then, the second illustration shows life beginning to sprout on the isles, with trees blossoming near what would become the witch arena on the knee of the isles. The third illustration conveying the end result of the isles, and damn, I never noticed how the isles themselves are are more or less shaped like the body as well. I always kind of viewed it as everything being built around the bones, but the skeleton of the titan serves as the literal skeleton for the shape of the isles. Emperor Bellows appeared out of nowhere on the Boiling Isles. Interesting. If you ask me, I don't think he's from the Demon Realm. Claiming magic was being utilized all sorts of wrong ways, and that he alone can communicate with the titan, or as King words it, the island. Now, this wording is actually key because it kind of confirms that with magic being everywhere on the island, it's almost bulletproof to say that the magic itself that permeates the island originates from the Titan. Now, Luce forged some sort of connection with the island in Adventure in the Elements, which means, if anything, she communicated with the Titan. I think it's easy to assume Bellos is lying in some capacity, or that his connection to the beast has a twist within itself. So if anything, Luce may have a very special advantage against the throwing Bellos in the near future. Maybe the Titan can straight up communicate to Luce, hey, uh, that bird guy is insane. Whatever he's saying, that's not me, bro. Another interesting line from King is, his teachings took hold, his strength grew, and he became Emperor Bellos. Somehow, what Bellows had to say really resonated with people and persuaded them to give up individuality for conformity. However, it makes you wonder if there was an emperor prior to Bellows or if he created the role. If it is the former, did Bellows overthrow them or did Bellows encourage his followers to do so instead? As King turns to the next page, we can make out some more text. Before he ascended to the throne, Emperor Bellows gained prominence as a crusader for unity during the Savage Ages. He believes that chaos comes from wild, and then the text is obscured, not ready to give away that lore yet, bring peace by controlling such magic in a coven system. He rules by fear and an iron fist, and his past remains largely unknown. Nevertheless, the Savage Ages caused such devastation that many people have proved willing to follow him. So yeah, that immediately touches on what I just said prior. He had followers. He had a compelling reasoning that the show wants to allude to, but not completely dish out on yet. And it seems his main approach is fear-mongering more than anything else. King's monologue also calls out that by only learning one track of magic under Bellus' system, knowledge is being restricted. The potential of each and every witch who follows restricted. Anyone who opposes are dubbed wild witches, facing petrification through an interesting method that, in my opinion, encourages the idea that Bellos is human. I have an entire video on that concept coming up, but we'll still touch on that later in the breakdown. 
Lastly, for this opening monologue, King's Lord Dumbonbello specifies that the Emperor retreated to his castle, establishing something I suggested in last episode's breakdown. He doesn't want to stray too far from the heart above the throne for a reason. He has way more guards than someone of his caliber should for a reason. We already saw he relies on palace men in order to keep himself regular. Luz fails to be intimidated by this, however, donning the cloak woven by Ida in the previous episode, ready to head into a dangerous rescue mission. The talk between Luz and King was really sweet. I love that this trio really do view one another as family. Back at Belus's castle, Ina is shown to still maintain a level of awareness in her Albeast form. Instead of mindlessly rampaging, she moves with a purpose, tearing down a tapestry of Bellus in the throne room and still managing to argue with Lilith by blowing a raspberry. Bellus arrives on the scene with his piercing glowing blue eyes. I guess it was an illusion magic and begins to display a form of magic that feels very unique to his character. Bellus is able to manipulate his body and teleport throughout the surrounding area by having it sink into the ground and reappear on the other side of his opponent. Not only that, but he appears to have a form of magic that I don't believe is accessible through Hexide, potentially because a natural born witch couldn't perform it at all. Some sort of false magic, one that glows a sinister red hue. Bellus being able to throw others around with this magic like a ragdoll, and even form objects like glowing red rope that restrains Ida. However, much like the petrification process, I find Bellus' staff extremely fascinating because both clearly aren't natural born magic at all, or any kind of relic, whatever magical artifact you would come to expect in the demon realm. Instead, it clearly appears to be technology that relies on harvested magic. This staff doesn't feature a palisman, but instead, sort of unfolds like a giant switchblade, or one of those toys with the Power Ranger weapons you would've got as a kid, and has an abundance of non-magical details, like a wire and bolt. But the most damning detail is the giant bulb with a glowing red core, which is what emits the energy he then uses to bring Ida back to her senses. It makes you wonder, is all that magic really of his own accord, or is this extensive getup he parades around in the actual sword of his power. Like those gloves. What if those gloves are a relic? Food for thought. Bellos apparently has no interest in Ida or, surprisingly, Luz directly, which kind of caught me off guard how he had no interest in pursuing Luz, Gus, or Willow further for their attempt at stealing the healing hat and using three of the grand relics accumulatively without consent, unsupervised, but hey, the dude's a man with a plan. Instead, Bellos wants the portal Luz came through. And he also goes on to reject healing Ida, claiming it's the will of the Titan, and that wild witches must be dealt with before the Day of Unity. With these two factors alone, the Day of Unity can easily be inferred as the moment where Earth and the Demon Realm will either merge or create a seamless bridge to one another, which ties into the piece of lore either revealed in the very first episode, that every myth in the human world is actually from the Demon Realm, a result of this world leaking into ours. I seriously doubt the Titan told Bellows not to heal Ida, but instead, he knows Ida is too strong and too powerful physically and mentally. She will conform to to him, so why on earth would he keep her around and allow her to very easily jeopardize his plans? Bellows also instructs Lilith to destroy Ida's staff, handing Albert and the staff individually. Now this caught my eye because the palisman that Bellows cracked open and used in the last episode was clearly attached to a destroyed staff. It's almost as if the palisman needs to be attached to the staff and then destroyed in order for it to remain completely inactive and for Bellows to consume it from there. Luckily, Albert evades his fate. Moving on, a news report broadcasted across crystal balls everywhere, everywhere including Amity's obligatory cameo, gives us the introduction of Gus's father, Perry Porter, a news reporter. Perry's occupation actually explains why Gus was great as a host and public speaker in Enchanting Grom Fright. Perry reveals that Ida is up for petrification due to her retrieval brawl with Lilith to save Luz being regarded as an assault on a coven leader, on top of refusing to join a coven in the first place. Despite being a wanted criminal and someone known to finesse others, the inhabitants of Bonesboro are greatly upset by this news. The town loves Ida. Porter going as far as dubbing this a grave day. It actually kind of bugged me out, like, geez. 
Ida really does not deserve everything she's been put through, and I'm glad the characters are able to recognize that. King remarks that the petrification is irreversible, and I think that's because, again, it's not some spell from raw magic, it's technology and science that harvest magic, and thus, makes it very challenging for magic to penetrate through. Also, Luz's anger towards Lilith feels like such an intense development that could go beyond this episode, that going forward, Luz could have serious trust issues with Lilith. I know a lot of people weren't thrilled by the ending of this episode due to a standpoint of stakes and pacing, but I think the aftermath and lasting consequences go further beyond Ida's outbeast transformation. The dynamic between all these characters will be different from where they initially began at the start of the series. After stepping on grass to gain a rest, which was my favorite gag in this episode, King and Luz head to the Conformatorium, where we see some of the petrified witches. Although we didn't get to see any of the names up close and personal, which was disappointing as it makes me wonder if these witches could even be important, we can spot some bounty signs, such as Teeth Magus, Scratcher, Snake Eater, and Three-Eyed Toad. I love that King states there won't be a statue going up there today, looking for Luz to agree, only for Luz's body language to infer that if it was up to her, there would be a statue going up today, but it would be the other Clawthorn. Warden Rap from the series premiere makes his return, thinking this will be his time to get an upper hand on Luz and exact revenge, only for Luz to make an example out of him with extremely powerful plant and ice spells that immediately put him in his place. The amplification of these spells in correlation to Luz's emotional state and willpower is something I don't feel is coincidental. I do think Luz's intense emotions draw out even more power from the Titan, boosting her spells, indicating whose side the Titan really would be on. Of course, using multiple glyphs would ideally yield similar results, which is something we see later when Luz charges at Lilith. Still, compared to episode 1, episode 5, hell, even episode 13, the way Luz makes short work of these guards is incredible. She's well on her way to becoming a proficient warrior and witch, no bile required. The townsfolk pondering if Ida really deserves petrification was a great moment. It ties into what I said earlier that, despite her flaws, no one writes her off as a bad person, even in spite of her defying the Emperor's order. Luz is able to get through to Ida's Albeast form with a mix of comfort, familiarity, and the light spell. A solution set up in both the intruder, with Ida's inclination toward shiny objects, and escape with the palisman, with King getting through the Ida with a similar emotional appeal. Ida gets sent to face the music, giving Luz the key to the human realm doorway. Shortly after, Lilith enters the scene with King, causing Luz to exclaim, you hurt Ida, before attacking Lilith with an array of spells. This scene is directly paralleled later, with Ida immediately exclaiming, you hurt Luz, at her sister before the petrification commences. It's another detail that really drives home how much they care for each other. The biggest thing that can set either of them off is one of them being hurt. Luz's attack on Lilith causes him to stumble back onto Earth, outside the house that initially brought Luz into the demon realm, meaning she's not that far off from her home. I really believed Luz's mom was going to make an appearance for just a brief moment, and I was mm, kind of disappointed. But honestly, I'm glad the show is keeping us on our toes. Riddled with guilt, Lilith explains her reasoning behind cursing Ida, leading into a flashback of the Clawthorn siblings in their youth. When they were younger, headed towards the Potion Coven, Lilith mastered a spell that allowed her to share any inflicted pain. With this spell declared, let the pain be shared, aiding her sister in moments of need. Lilith goes on to explain that being in the Emperor's Coven was her dream, that she wanted to work alongside the most powerful witch on the Isles and make the world a better place. Something she begins to truly work towards at the end of this episode by reconciling with her sister and betraying the Emperor. After all, it has been proclaimed as the most powerful witch on the Isles before. And for what I've already put out into the world, I have my doubts on Bellows being a pure-blooded witch. The two Clawthorn sisters faced conflict when the time arrived for them to compete against one another for the single spot in the Emperor's Coven. Knowing Ida would best her, Lilith sought after a way to win, quoting Bellus's ideology. To be great, you have to make great sacrifices. A line that's reflected with Lilith's sacrifice of taking on Ida's curse by the episode's end. This abridged version of events doesn't explain how Lilith was drawn to this particular curse, or why she thought it would be temporary, but for those who have checked out my true villains of the Owl House theory, you know I have been pointing to the Blight parents influencing Lilith to curse Ida in their youth. 
And while Lilith does not mention the involvement of anyone else, likely to avoid looking as if she's shifting the blame, wouldn't you know it? Two very special characters can be spotted in the background when Ida forfeits and then succumbs to her curse. A green-haired girl that looks quite familiar, in the Oracle track, according to her purple uniform, and a messy brown-haired boy in the Abomination track by her side. Although the girl's a dead giveaway, just by comparing the silhouettes of their older selves, we can easily piece together that these two students are none other than the parents of Amity Blight. Whereas everyone else reacts to Ida's transformation and celebrates Lilith's victory, Amity's mother can just be seen watching the events unfold with what I read as a knowing smirk on her face. I could be wrong, I could be reading way too much into it. She could have just been illustrated with a menacing smile for the sake of viewers picking up who she is. But considering how menacing she was just to Willow, I just would not be surprised if she had a hand in this. Even with Lilith's explanation, it still is obviously a crummy thing for her to curse her sister off the merits of insecurity and jealousy, so while this could just be a neat easter egg to further set the Blight parents in Season 2, I'd like to believe they were the ones who pointed Lilith in the direction of the curse, with the misinformation that it would only last a day for their own benefit. With Lilith now helping Luce and King fight the good fight, they return back to the demon realm, but before Luce herself returns, she takes the moment to really ponder why this gateway consistently leads to this abandoned house on Earth. At least, that was my takeaway. Giving two major glances before walking through the door for what could be the last time. Luz, King, and Lilith are ambushed by the Emperor, who appears to be sitting on a throne made from the jaw of a beast, potentially one of the other titans mentioned earlier in the book, with its gnarly intestines functioning as vines. With the bulb of Bellus' staff glowing, I can only imagine that's how he's really commanding the remains. But nevertheless, he requests a moment alone with Luz. King and Lilith catch Ida up to speed before the petrification process commences, with, you guessed it, another machine that seems to utilize and harvest magic. Magic. You can't turn people into stone by creating a circle with your finger belly. In fact, Bellis didn't use any kind of ring to cast a spell in this episode. Really makes you think who he really is, what he really is. Mr. Porter refers to King as a deranged cat which feels like a stab at everyone who thought King was a skull cat and not a dog, which, according to Dana, he apparently is. Let me tell you guys, when tagging videos for the Owl House, I had Scold Cat come up as a recommended tag for a very long time. Like, way past the show's premiere, what were we doing? Willow and Gus hijack Porter's mic, encouraging the townsfolk to stand up to Bellows for Ida's freedom, leading to various characters standing up for her, an overall reflection of season one. A prisoner remarks she helped him escape jail, referring to the series premiere. Morton remarks Ida helped him stay in business, referring to Hootie's moving hassle, and even Principal Bum states she helped him love teaching again, after she left. Referring to the arc of Luce joining Hexide, found in episodes such as Something Venture Something Framed and The First Day. Everyone chanting for the Emperor to let Ida go gives him a convenient out for the episode's end. And while I'm bullying Belos, the biggest moment of him being a fraud comes when we return to his confrontation with Luce. Our brave hero demands that Belos lets her friends go attempting to intimidate Bellows with an ice spell. Pulling a reverse Uno, Bellows dematerializes and reappears behind Luce, using his red energy to throw her against a statue. So, why would such a display of power make him out to be a fraud? Well, the entire point of Luce's cape was that it was set to deflect any type of magic, and there wasn't any disclaimer on power scaling. The detail made it seem like it would have had a great payoff in this episode, and I believe it did, just not in the way we expected. I suspect the payoff was in the fact that it seemingly failed without even drawing attention to it. Bellows appeared behind Luce meaning her cape should have been protecting her. Yet it didn't. Why? Because whatever Bellows is doing is not raw magic. At the very least, it's not something he's doing solely off of his latent ability. Luz casts an array of spells to maneuver around Bellows' tricks and abilities, which I believe could honestly be necromancy to an extent, one of these attacks actually being the giant green elongated monster from the theme song, which Luz blows up from the inside. I found this detail interesting because, in a way, it establishes that Bellows has always been present, and that this monster is technically his appearance in the theme song, chasing Luz and Ida. Ultimately, Luz is able to demonstrate that Bellows is vulnerable by piercing his mask, chipping off a piece, and causing him to go full Sans Undertale. Or at least, he would've 
but considering how weakened he appeared in his debut before shredding a palisman, I think him refraining from attacking Luce was really just him being aware that he was going to run low on energy. Bella's backtracks. While Ida begins to take the hit for petrification, saying he is but a humble messenger for the Titan, and that the Coven doesn't plan to simply invade the human realm, hiding behind this big boogeyman for his reasoning. However, Bello still demands the portal, which Luce was instructed to destroy, but obviously had no time to, at least until now. As Luce verbally apologizes to her mother, because as we know, she's about to kiss her way home goodbye, handing Bello's the portal to the human realm, but then using Ida's staff in conjunction with her own glyphs planted on the briefcase to blow it to smithereens. And we can assume the key to actually activate the gateway is still on loose, which will inconvenience Bellus's future plans. Still, with this, the first big hidden message through the first letter of every episode title finally makes itself known. A witch loses a true way. Loose the human loses her way back home to her mother on Earth. Luce rescues Ida, Lilith, and King, destroying the petrification machine as Lilith heals Ida. And as they flee, Bellos announces to the crowd that the Titan has encouraged him to spare Ida's life. Sure, Belly, sure. But something he says that isn't a crock of shit, Ida's depleted of magic, now having to move forward without the powers she once knew. This takes us to the episode and season's end. Back at the Owl House, Lilith makes a brave sacrifice, using the spell of shared pain once more to share the curse evenly with her sister, causing the Clawthorn sisters to both share one gray eye, although Ida's gem is still pitch black. I know a lot of people have had mixed feelings or just straight up dissatisfied with how quickly Lilith reconciled with her sister, but here's my take on it. Lilith didn't need some sort of redemption arc that spanned multiple episodes, a storyline where she's an antagonist but then listens to reason. We didn't need any more of that drama. I say this because although you can read the end of the episode as instant forgiveness, from Lilith's point of view, this entire first season was her redemption arc. Her purpose from the jump was healing Ida and being on the same team again, but from the misguided angle of forcing Ida to join the Emperor's Coven. Once Lilith betrayed the Emperor, she finally achieved that goal, at least halfway. They still have a lot of things to work through, such as a lack of magic, Lilith still has to be held accountable and a sister's sister going forward, but I don't think prolonging at this point would have done anyone any favors. Although Ida can no longer perform magic naturally, the student has now become the master, as Luce is ready to teach Ida the ways of the glyphs, a new way to perform magic. And with that setup alone, season 2 may already feel like an entirely new show, but still more of what we had before. And that's the kind of magic I love to see. Lilith also claims she's been weakened, but it's kind of vague on if her magic is still active, but her blue gem remaining colored still says yes. Luz is now recording video messages to her mom, which are completely honest about her escapades, and I'm interested in seeing where that can go, or if she even sent it. Can she even send it? Before, she was getting Wi-Fi through the portal, but the portal's gone. Still, Luz is determined to find a way home. Although we still don't know who wrote those letters, the creepy loose theory kind of made sense, but now we know the Emperor never had a way to Earth. Aside from the obvious one-way ticket he had to the Demon Realm. I hope. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm a liar. And that takes us to an ominous cliffhanger that once again alludes to Bellos not being a pure-blooded witch capable of performing raw magic, as this man is pulling a Gravity fall. Seriously? You're pulling a Bill Cipher? A Ford Pines? Bro, what is going on at Disney? Because this isn't just a Gravity Falls thing. There's portals in Phineas and Ferb, including the new movie. I'm sure Kim Possible has had a portal. Like, Disney TVA showrunners, blink twice if portal is somewhere in the contract. Like, seriously, even Star had portals. Oh my god, Star had so many portals. Still, Bellows is having a portal constructed underneath his castle, or the conformatorium, they're not really clear, with the shattered pieces of Ida's portal, informing Kikimura that they'll be keeping an eye on the inhabitants of the Owl House, nodding to a mysterious guard, who happened to be the one sitting closest to his throne with a very unique mask that has a striking resemblance to Hootie. If anything, this could be Creepy Loose, or something I theorized before, a relative of Loose who's been in the Demon Realm for a very long time. 
Still, why all the technology and machines when we've seen so much magic? Nothing is as it seems, but the Day of Unity seems to be something frightening that we'll work up to in Season 2. But in terms of Season 1, that's a wrap, everybody! We did it! God, the season flew by! Kudos for Disney for not taking an entire year, like with Gravity Falls. So I assume the hiatus also won't be too bad, as I believe Season 2 began production late last year, if not sooner. So although I'll make a proper video on its return, I think January 2021 is the latest we could expect it. Maybe February, maybe even later than that. But I feel like Disney has become dedicated to giving their shows good, consistent schedules without too long of a break. But as always, these are just my thoughts and I want to hear yours. What do you think? How did you feel? feel about this epic season finale? Love it? Hate it? Why or why not? Was there anything we missed? What theories do you have? And trust us, now that the season is over, we aren't going to be behind anymore. We're coming at you with all the Owl House theories we can muster. And now that the season is over, if you need another show to watch, Amphibia is a great choice. And not only are we covering that overarching story, but we're going to make some content to entice people into checking it out. With all that said, drop your thoughts in the comments below or tweet your thoughts at RontableVids. And for more of my own thoughts, you can find me at Austin Fox. We're also on Instagram. If you enjoyed this video, please draw a like and subscribe to the Round for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have an awesome day. Altric Vox, signing out.